Welcome to a new episode of the ITU Journal webinar series, where you can find insights and forward-looking research on future and evolving technologies. The ITU Journal is an international journal providing complete coverage of all communications and networking paradigms, free of charge for both readers and authors. This publication considers yet-to-be-published papers addressing fundamental and applied research, building bridges between disciplines, connecting theory with application, and stimulating international dialogue. Its interdisciplinary approach reflects ITU's comprehensive field of interest and explores the convergence of ICT with other disciplines. We count on your support to make this webinar an interesting experience. Please submit your questions via the Q&A channel at the bottom of your screen. All questions from the audience will be taken during the Q&A session after the talk. The meeting is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the webinar website. Closed captioning is also available for this event. You can enable this by clicking on the closed caption icon at the bottom of your screen. We hope that you will enjoy the talk and we encourage you to stay connected until the end for the Wisdom Corner. I will now give the floor to our Master of Ceremonies. Hello and welcome to our new webinar series with academics of the IT Journal on Future in Evolving Technologies. My name is Alessia Magliarditi from ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. I'm very pleased to open the webinar today with Professor Fadel Adib from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, USA. We count on your support to make this webinar an exciting experience. So please submit your question via the Q&A channel. We will address them to our speaker during the Q&A session. After the Q&A, as just announced by our avatar, I will moderate the Wisdom Corner, live life lessons. So please stay online. Professor Adib agreed to a personal chat. He will share with us some lessons learned over the years that might perhaps be useful for some of you. I'm very pleased now to introduce Professor Iana Kirdit, Editor-in-Chief of the ITU Journal and Founder and President of Truva from the USA. Professor Akirdis is Ken Byers Chair Professor in Telecommunications Emeritus at the Georgia Institute of Technology. He established many research centers worldwide, including South Africa, Spain, Saudi Arabia, and Finland. He's Editor-in-Chief of Impact Factor Journal and highly cited and at the top of the most prestigious international rankings, visiting distinguished professor in several universities around the world. His current research interest includes 6 7G wireless communication systems, hologram communication, terahertz, molecular communication, internet of bio nano things, reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, nano networks, and many other subjects. So I'm very pleased to give the floor to Professor Iana Kildit, who will introduce our speaker and moderate the Q&A session. Thank you, Ian. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Alessia. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening all around the world from Reykjavik, Iceland, with love. I again welcome you all to the fourth season of our ITU Journal Future and Evolving Technologies webinar series. 
In the first three seasons, we had research leaders from academia, industry, and we continue this tradition in this season also. We are happy to have again many leaders lined up in this season also. One of them is today's speaker, Professor Fadel Adib. Before I present Fadel, I would like to briefly talk about our journal. The objective of our journal is to bring the academic and industry worlds together in order to establish a strong bridge between academia and industry. Our journal idea was incubated back in December 2019, and the inaugural issue was published in December 2020. It is an open access journal, no fees for readers, no fees for authors. The papers go through a rigorous review process, and we try to uh, cover all forefront and timely research activities in the academic and industrial world. The journal is a product of a big team effort, and I would like to acknowledge them here. Cesar Onosan, Bilal Jamusi, Alessia Malarditi, and Erika Campagnola, and many others for their work, efforts, continuous support, and dedication for the success of our journal. I encourage you all to submit your papers, and also if you have ideas for special issues on popular topics, please do not hesitate to contact us. Today, I have a great pleasure to present you our speaker, Fadel Adib. First of all, on behalf of our entire journal team, I personally thank Fadel to accept our invitation and give this webinar today. Fadel received BS degree for, from AUB, American University of Beirut in 12, 2011. And in fact, I was there <laughs> in AUB, which is a, one of the most beautiful campuses in the world next to the Mediterranean Sea. And I was there in 2011 and also I think 28 twice. And I really enjoyed it. I have many friends in AUB and I highly recommend you to visit Beirut, my beautiful Beirut and of course Lebanon. And he received PhD degree from MIT in 2016, where his PhD thesis won the Sproul's Award for Best Doctoral Dissertation at MIT and ACM Sigma Bill Doctoral Dissertation Award. Fadel joined the MIT faculty and currently is an associate professor in the MIT lab and the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. He is the founding director of the Signal Kinetics Group, which invents wireless and sensor technologies for climate, health, robotics, and smart environments. His, his research has led to multiple startups, and he is currently the founder and CEO of Cartesian Systems, a spin-off from his lab that focuses on mapping the physical world at unprecedented, unprecedented scale. Fadel was named by Technology Review as one of the world's top 35 innovators under 35 and by Forbes as 30 under 30. As research on wireless sensing X-ray vision was recognized as one of the 50 ways MIT has transformed computer science and his work on robotic perception, finder of lost things was named one of the 103 ways MIT is making a better world. Fadel's commercialized technologies have been and uh, used to monitor thousands of patents with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and COVID-19. He has had the honor to present his work to multiple leaders and heads of state, including President Obama at the White House. Fadel is also the recipient of various awards including NSF Career Award 2019, the ONR, that's Office Naval Research Young Investigator Award 2019, again, ONR Early Career Grant 2020, and Google Faculty Research Award 2017. Sloan Research Fellowship, which is prestigious 2021. Actually, the others are also prestigious, of course. The <laughs> ACM Sigmobile Rockstar Award 2022, and the GAM or GAM Genius Award 2023, and his papers have won 
awards for best papers, demos, and highlights at premier academic venues, including ACM SICCOM, ACM MOBICOM, ACM CHA, and IEEE RFID, and Natural Electronics and Nature Communications. Due to Google, Google Scholar, his age index is 26, and total number of citations to his papers is 6,542. In short, he is, in my opinion, also, uh, you know, it's well accepted. He is the superstar of his generation, and we are really fortunate to listen to him today. Without further ado, let us wish to all of us an enjoyable webinar. Thanks again, Fadel, and it's yours. See you. Thank you so much, uh, Jan, for your kind introduction um, and for inviting me to be here. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone today and to share our research. Our research is um, motivated by a desire to decode or uncover hidden worlds. Personally, I want to be able to see and sense what is difficult for us to um, see today because it's out of our reach and be or because it is hidden. And today I wanna share with you technologies that we've been developing for unprecedented sensing and connectivity and about the applications of these, these technologies in areas spanning climate, robotics, and smart environments. The work that I'll be sharing with you today has been done by two of my teams, both my research lab at MIT and my startup Cartesian that spun out of my lab at MIT. I want to start by asking a question. What plays the largest role in the world's climate? Is it CO2, transportation, food production? Actually, what plays the largest role in the world's climate is the ocean. It determines our weather, it mediates our climate system, and it is also the part of the, our world that has been most impacted by climate change. Over the past two decades, the ocean has absorbed more than 90% of excess heat that we have emitted into the atmosphere. Today, the ocean holds more than 93% of CO2 on the planet. With the ocean playing such an enormous role in weather, climate, and climate change, you might wonder, how much of the ocean have we measured? Let me ask this question in a different way. What percent of the ocean has never been observed. The percentage is over 95%. It means that our climate models are missing data from over 95% of the ocean. And it means that we do not know in what way climate change has been impacting the vast majority of the ocean. Now, I'm a scientist and an engineer, and to understand something, I need to measure it. So a few years ago, my group and I started to think about how we can observe all the hidden parts of the ocean. And our idea was that we wanted to build an internet of things to observe and decode the underwater world. Basically, we wanted to take a network of sensors, for example, sensors that can measure temperature, pH, underwater currents, deploy them in the ocean and have them transmit data back to us. And if we can do that, we can start observing the ocean at different scales and over long periods of time. But as we tried to do that, we faced a problem. And the problem was that the battery life of underwater sensors is extremely limited. As we looked deeper into this problem, we realized that the reason is that underwater transmissions consume significant power, tens to hundreds of watts. Not only this, unlike typical IoT sensors, they cannot be recharged easily. If you want to charge a sensor that is deployed in the ocean, you have to send a research vessel, pay fifty to $70,000 a day just to replace its battery and come back. And this is why state-of-the-art sensors for continuously tracking marine animals can only last for a few hours or days, after which their batteries die. And this makes it very difficult to use them for long-term observations or, for example, for climate sensing or discovering migration patterns of animals. And it got us thinking about ways that we can reduce the energy consumption of underwater communications. 
Today, I want to share you, with you how we overcame this problem. And we did this by developing a technology that enables underwater backscatter networking. This kind of communication technology consumes net zero power, which enables our sensors to operate over long periods of time without requiring any batteries. Let me describe to you how our technology works by comparing it to traditional underwater communication. In these two environments, you typically have an underwater drone or a submarine or ship or even a base station near the shore that communicates with a large number of sensors. For simplicity, let's just focus on one sensor, sensor say a temperature sensor. And let us say that this sensor needs to transmit its data to the underwater drone. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, we can't use Wi-Fi or Bluetooth underwater because they rely on radio frequency signals that die exponentially fast in water. To send information to the drone, today's sensors have to use acoustic signals. So the sensor has a speaker, the underwater drone has a hydrophone, which is an underwater microphone, and the sensor transmits sound waves. The problem with this approach is that generating an acoustic signal requires a lot of energy, which drains the sensor's battery. In contrast, our technology does not require the sensor to generate any acoustic signal. Let me tell you how it works. In our design, both the speaker and the hydrophone are on the drone. And the sensor instead has an acoustic reflector, which you can think of as a mirror. Now, when the drone sends sound or an acoustic signal, it will reflect off this reflector and come back to the hydrophone. And in order for the sensor to communicate data, all it needs to do is to switch between, for example, reflective and not reflective states. Once it can switch between two states, it can encode bits of zero or one. And because it can encode any data in binary, it can encode its sensor data as messages in binary and communicate them by simply modulating the reflections of acoustic signals. So in contrast to the traditional approach where the sensor needs to generate its own acoustic signal, in our method, the sensor communicates by simply reflecting or modulating the reflections of acoustic signals. Now you might be wondering, what did I do? I just moved all the energy consumption from the sensor to the drone. And the answer is yes, but that's exactly what I wanted to do because the drone has its own power source. And so it can generate sound while well, now I can make the sensors extremely low power and extend this to a very large number of sensors deployed. Now, all of this is great, but there's still one question, which is how do we control the reflections of acoustic signals? Our idea was to use piezoelectricity to design programmable acoustic reflectors. For those of you who are not familiar, the piezoelectric effect refers to the ability of some materials to transform mechanical to electrical energy. Let me explain to you what I mean by this. Let's say we take a piezoelectric material and we measure the voltage across uh, its terminals. If you have a speaker and the speaker sends sound, sound travels as a pressure wave. So when it hits the material, the material vibrates. And because of this vibration, you start getting an electrical signal across it. So Effectively, the material has transformed mechanical energy, which is sound, to electrical energy, which is voltage. But remember, what I want to do is to transform this material into a reflector. To do that, all we did is we added a switch across the terminals of the material. When the switch is open, the material behaves freely, transforming mechanical to electrical energy. But let us see what happens when the switch is closed. When the switch is closed, the two terminals of the materials are connected to each other. And so when they're connected to each other, you cannot have any voltage. And when you cannot have a voltage, the material cannot vibrate. So you have incoming acoustic energy and the material cannot vibrate. So where does this energy go? The energy has to be reflected back. So by simply turning a switch on and off, we're able to transform this material from an absorber to a reflector of energy. And that's how we're able to modulate the reflections of acoustic signals. 
Now, this is a simplified description of how the technology works. In practice, what we do is we modulate the reflection coefficient gamma of the technology, the reflection coefficient um, of the piezoelectric material, and that allows us to modulate these reflections. We call this technology piezoacoustic backscatter because it uses the piezoelectric effect in order for it to backscatter or reflect back acoustic signals. And what we've shown is that our sensor requires a million times less power, about 20 microwatts, than state-of-the-art low power underwater motors. Not only that, in the non-reflective or, or absorptive states, it can also harvest energy from sound. And that allows us to make the entire sensor battery free because it's harvest energy to power up and it uses this small amount of energy that it gets in order for it to communicate by modulating acoustic reflection. Let me show you a short clip of this technology in action. We shot this clip um, in a pool here on MIT's campus. At the far end of the pool, there's a hydrophone and there's a projector. And here's our batteryless sensor connected to a circuit. And the circuit has an LED. Now, as I play the video, notice that the LED lights up, even though the sensor has no battery. And the reason is that it is able to harvest enough energy in order for it to power up and also communicate. Now, let me show you how we're able to decode the sensor's response. So I'm going to take the signal that we received at the far end of the pool on the hydrophone, and I want to plot the normalized amplitude of the signal as a function of time. This is the signal that is measured by the hydrophone. You see at, a, at about two and a half seconds, the speaker starts transmitting, so you see a jump in the transmitted signal. And about at about three seconds, the nose starts backscattering. So you can see the changes between two different reflective, between two different states, because the node is switching between reflecting or absorbing signals. And if you're wondering why the amplitude does not go entirely to zero when the signal is, um, when the node is absorbing energy, remember that you're not just getting reflections from the node, but from other sources of reflections in the environment. And in our papers, what we've shown, we've developed different algorithms and techniques to scale to many nodes in the environment, for example, by applying coding techniques and also to deal with other reflections in the environment. Over here, you can see one of our prototypes. Actually, it's uh, I have it also here in my hand. We fabricate and 3D print our transducers in-house. Sometimes I get the question of, how do you know in which direction you need to reflect the signal path? And the answer to that is remember that the mirror is really an analogy. In practice, you can make the reflector omnidirectional so that irrespective of where you get the signal from, you're able to re-emit it back in that direction. We also built the hardware for energy harvesting, bidirectional communication, and integrated different sensors. And one of the other important things about this technology is that this whole sensor costs $100, which is a very low cost when you compare it to what traditional underwater communication systems require in oceanography, which is usually something of the order of thousands to tens of thousands of dollars. And it consumes on top of that extremely low power. Over the past few years, we've been developing this technology in different ways. We developed different node designs and architectures so that we can enable wider bandwidth communication, develop retro-reflective nodes in underwater environments. We developed also the communication theory and different methods, including MIMO, full duplex, different MAC protocols, modulation schemes, and link budget analysis. We also showed how you could use these underwater backscatter nodes for localization. Similar to how Wi-Fi and Bluetooth do not work underwater, GPS also does not work underwater because it relies on radio frequency signals. And we showed how you could use these batteryless sensors to enable battery-free underwater GPS. We also developed into our electronics and deployed tiny ML models so that we can do inference on these uh, barrierless nodes and you can do uh, low power machine learning on them for inference and, and climate modeling. And also we built imaging methods that could run based on this technology and transmit their data to a remote receiver. Now I don't have time to go over all of these. But I want to briefly talk about two of our more recent results in this space. 
one of the questions that we had for a while was, what is the realistic range, communication range of underwater bass scatter? And how do different design parameters impact this range? So last year, we completed the first end-to-end -end link budget analysis of underwater bass scatter. Our analysis took into account the transmissions and the reception and also the electronic components. We modeled the electrical, the power loss, uh, the harvested energy, the signal to noise ratio. We did a theoretical, analytical, and experimental modeling. And what's really important is that our experimental evaluation of the theory that we developed showed us that our practical evaluation in real environments matches the theory that we developed within 0 0.5 dB. And this is extremely important because it means that our model can be used and can be developed to understand in what way um, we can deploy these, this technology as a function of different design parameters. And using this model, we then started simulating how it would operate in the ocean and over what distances. And what we showed is that you can extend this technology to kilometer scale distances. And that is means that it already enables many applications, for example, in coastal monitoring, in aquaculture monitoring, if you have a base station near the shore, you can deploy a lot of sensors offshore and use them for environmental monitoring. It is also important because most of the ocean is less than one kilometer deep. So if you now deploy these sensors at the bottom of the ocean and you have our reader or our uh, hydrophone and projector on a ship, then as these ships or drones roam the ocean, they'd be able to monitor more than 50% of the ocean using these sensors. Another recent result that I want to talk about is how we built the world's first battery-free and wireless underwater camera. So I want to show you a video from this camera. Over here to the right, you can see our underwater measurement setup. And to the left, you see our received and reconstructed image. Here you can see our camera, a multicolor flash, and an underwater coral that we're imaging. As I play the video, you'll notice three things. First, we emit light because in deep sea environments, there is darkness. Second, we uh, the light is of different colors because we're doing color reconstruction and the lowest power imaging sensors are CMOS. So we're able to, we developed a multicolor illumination mechanism that enables us to build extremely low power imaging, but still be able to reconstruct color. And the third, you saw that the image was reconstructed in chunks because of the bandwidth and memory limitations of underwater of these underwater sensors. I will say that this result is from about a year ago, and now we're able to do real-time imaging and reconstruction using the uh, newer cameras that we have developed, which are still unpublished. I wanna show you some of the images that we captured here. For example, this is an image of an African starfish. This is an image of uh, pollution in the wild. My students took our camera, went to one of the uh, lakes here in uh, a nearby lakes, and they showed that they could use it for imaging, uh, for example, underwater pollution, a plastic bottle. And over here, this is a, a pretty remarkable result. What we did is we took the seeds of an underwater plant and we planted it uh, in an underwater environment. And we used our camera to observe it over multiple days. And you could see the, the seed sprouting and the, the plant growing over the days. And the reason this result is so important goes back to how I started the motivation by saying that today it's very difficult to do long-term underwater observations because you're worried about your sensors running out of batteries. Because we're able to build a camera that is battery-free, not only can we do sensing, we can even do imaging over long periods of time without worrying about it running out of batteries. And while we've demonstrated many exciting applications with underwater backscatter, we've only started this scratching the surface of possibilities with this new technology. For example, building on localization, now we're building the, we're developing these underwater drones and robots that could be used to navigate the ocean and find their way back by using these uh, batteryless sensors. We're also building these amphibious micro robots that could also be battery free as they roam the ocean and still can track their locations and communicate their data to remote receivers. We're extending our backscatter to the uh, communication networks to build larger scale networks and swarms. 
We're moving towards even lower power designs through ASICs and chipless tags. And there's many other exciting applications and advanced imaging, uh, joint sensing and communications, uh, long-term deployments and so on. Over the, the past few years, we've run tens of thousands of experimental trials in the ocean. Here you can see two of my students, Osby and Jose, extracting one of our battery-free nodes with temperature and uh, pressure sensors. And all of this started with the goal of building an internet of things to decode the underwater world for climate applications. And there's many exciting applications from scientific exploration using our cameras, from seafood production. The United Nations declared that aquaculture or seafood production is the world's fastest growing food sector. One in three people in the world rely on the ocean as their primary source of protein. And we wanna build an IoT to be able to monitor these aquaculture farms. And there's many other applications for underwater IoT in robotics, disaster response, defense, and so on. One of the other areas that I'm really excited about is in extraterrestrial applications. Scientists discovered subsurface oceans in Saturn's moon Enceladus and Jupiter's moon Europa. Over there, you can imagine that it's even more difficult to replace a battery once you send a sensor. So we're working with scientists to incorporate our technology as part of future space missions in order to search for extraterrestrial life in these subsurface oceans. And because of all of these applications of uh, the, this technology, we've released all the code and schematics and tutorials for underwater mass scatter. And I hope that some of you will uh, start also building on our research and using our data sets to help us and to work together in advancing this technology. And I wanna backtrack with the question that we started with, which is how we can sense hidden worlds uh, in the ocean. And next, I want to talk about a different type of research that we do in sensing hidden world, but this time in the context of robotics. The work that we've been doing in robotics has been, motiv has been motivated by the many advances that we've seen in computer vision over the past few years, where researchers have demonstrated the ability to enable robots to almost see, uh, see like we humans see. Coming at this problem, we started think, thinking, can we enable robots per, to perceive things that are otherwise invisible to the human eye? For example, can a robot see what is inside a closed box? Can it tell whether the food or medicine inside a closed bottle is safe? Or can a robot touch an item that it cannot see from under the pot? To answer these questions, our approach was to augment robots with wireless perception. Unlike computer vision, wireless radio frequency signals can traverse occlusions, which is why, for example, you can get Wi-Fi from another room. And so we use this in order for us to build robots that have perception that extends beyond the line of sight. So let me show you an example of how we do this. Over here, you could see that we, there's a, a robot and we added antennas on the robot scripper. The robot is searching for a key that is hidden under the pot. Now the robot also has a camera on its arm, but the camera's line of sight is blocked to the keys. In fact, if you look at the camera from the camera's field of view, you will not be able to see the items. The robot is able to move around, locate the keys, declutter and remove what is on top of them, and then pick up the item. The robot also works in different environments. So for example, over here, you could see it um, manipulating complex things like clothes, where it is searching for, for example, here, over here, a hidden remote control that is under the pile. So it moves, it locates the remote control, moves the things to the side, and then it is able to pick it up, to pick up the remote control. And it hands it over to my uh, PhD students so that Tara so that she can watch her favorite TV show. So how we, did we do this? How were we able to enable the robot to find and see things that are otherwise not visible to its camera? The way we did this is by leveraging the most pervasive IoT device. What is the most pervasive IoT device? Battery-free RFID tags. Today, there is more than 100 billion RFID tags that are already deployed in the world in things like 
clothing, medicine, drugs, automotive parts, and we use these same RFIDs that are already deployed in order for us to enable these capabilities. So for example, this is a certain kind of RFID. They cost about two to three cents. They come in different shapes. They're mainly stickers. They have a very small chip in them and they're battery free. Some of them are even much smaller and weave in into our clothes. And the way it works is that the robot sends a wireless signal to power up these battery-free RFID tags and they respond with their identifier. The robot uses this signal in order for it to measure the time of flight on battery-free RFID tags. So what does it mean to measure time of flight on battery-free RFID tags? For those of you who are familiar, you know that actually it is not possible traditionally to measure time of flight on RFIDs. Time of flight estimation usually requires much more expensive ultra wideband tags. Something similar like the Apple Air tags, which are about $20 to $30, versus battery free RFIDs, which usually cost about two to three cents. So to enable estimating time of flight on off the shelf tags, we introduced a new technology that is called dual frequency excitation. And what this technology does is that it emulates ultra wideband on off the shelf battery free RFID. I want to explain this technology by comparing it to how traditional RFID communications work. RFIDs communicate using a concept called backscatter, which is similar to what I just described to you in underwater environments. So let us say that you have a UHF, it's standard UHF RFID tag. A reader transmits a frequency at UHF in the ISM band. The tag harvests energy to power up, and then it modulates the carrier wave, and it modulates it by changing the reflection pattern, the RF reflection pattern. The problem is that RFID's communication in the UHF band has a narrow bandwidth, which is of the order of 20 megahertz ISM band. A narrow bandwidth cannot be used to estimate time of flight because it is just too small of a set of frequencies. And you can't simply transmit a much wider number of frequencies and estimate them because the, the tag will not even power up altogether. So instead, our approach was to introduce two frequencies at the same time, dual frequency excitation. So the reader transmits both the UHF frequency in the ISM band and the ultra wide band at the same time. What this allows it to do is that once the tag powers up using the UHF uh, frequency, it now is able to modulate both the UHF and the ultra wide band signal. And what that allows us to do is to estimate the channel over a wide bandwidth. Now that we're able to estimate the channel over a wide bandwidth, we're able to estimate the time of flight, and that allows us to achieve centimeter scale localization. So because you are able to estimate the time, you're able to measure, you multiply it by the speed of propagation and you measure the distance. Knowing the distance, you can now localize the RFID on a sphere that is centered at the antenna's location. You go ahead and combine that now with computer vision. And by combining it with computer vision, you can narrow the locations that the RFID can be. Then the robot can selectively move around, query the RFID from a few different locations, zero in on this location. And now, even though it cannot see it, it knows where it is. So it goes ahead, removes what is on top of it, and then it is able to pick up the right item. And once it picks it up, it can then query it one last time to verify that it's in its hand and then declare task completion. Now, the big, the technical problem to move from time of flight estimation to efficiently locating the tag was, how does the robot know where it needs to move in order for it to collect additional estimates? This is a classical robotics problem that is called next best view. And the robot is trying to um, balance between two things. The first thing is that it needs to account for a wireless problem called dilution of precision. So the, if the robot moves by a further distance and it collects wireless measurements from distances that are further from each other, then you get a much better precision in localization because you get further apart vantage points. Higher precision if the robot moves more. 
but we want the robot to not move a lot because if the robot keeps moving a lot, then it becomes very inefficient. It needs to search the environment a lot before it can go and find the item. So on the other hand, what we want is we want to minimize the displacement of the robot. And so we formulate this as an optimization problem that combines both the dilution of precision and minimizing the displacement. And we solve it using an artificial reinforcement learning framework that we developed. And we showed that using this framework, we're able to achieve extremely high success rate in line of sight, non-line of sight, and highly colored environments. Then we started thinking whether we can take this a step further. What if, for example, the item that we're looking for in the pile is not tagged. Some items are tagged, but some are not tagged. Or maybe the RFID fell off the item. What happens then? What we did is we developed a probabilistic sensor fusion approach that allows us to reason about the environment by combining RF and computer vision. So let me show you an example of how this works. Over here, you have a target item, which is a, a soft animal that is uh, not visible and not tagged. And we also have a bunch of other tagged items in the environment. Now, as I play the video, you'll realize that the robot immediately knows where the target item is, even though it's not tagged and not visible. Removes what is on top of it, and then it sees it, and it goes ahead, and it is able to pick up the right item. So how was the robot able to find the item so quickly, even though it was not tagged and it was not visible? The reason is because the robot is using both computer vision and RF to reason about the environment. And the basic idea is, it looks at the pile, it knows that I have a bunch of RFID tagged items over here in the pile. So the item that I'm looking for is probably is less likely for it to be where the other items are hidden. And so the only place that it could probably fit probabilistically is in another region of the pond. And so it is able to combine RF and computer vision in an optimization framework to reason about the environment and to be able to much more efficiently uh, perform its task. So by comparison, if there were no RFIDs at all, then the robot needs to keep searching the environment until it finds the item. And this is why our robotic system is two times faster than state-of-the-art vision-based systems, even though the item of interest is on top. And we've also extended this, this technology to deformable objects using our visual Gaussian curves. Recently, we've been uh, taking this also, this idea of being able to localize RF tags and thinking about how it can be used, not just, for example, for peace picking robots, but for drones. For those of you who are familiar with drone navigation in indoor environments, one of the hardest problems is what happens if there is darkness or if there's a, an environment where it's actually difficult for the robot to navigate indoors. Because outdoors, you can use GPS. But indoors, if the environment is dark or it doesn't have many features, then you start running through this problem where the robot cannot navigate and it cannot localize itself. So what we did recently is we developed a technique that uses the next generation of RFIDs. These are millimeter wave RFID tags that we've developed, which use technologies in the 5G to 6G, and it uses them for accurate position. So for example, in this video over here, this robot is gonna be using these tags in order to localize itself. The robot has a millimeter wave radar mounted on it. And there is a tag that is in the environment. These eventually can be made even like sticker similar to the RFIDs. And the robot uses these tags in order for it to localize and itself and track its location. So in the bottom left, you can see 2D space. You could see MyFly, which is our system as uh, in a uh, blue and the ground truth in red. And you can see that as the robot moves, our system is, can accurately track in a way, in a manner that is similar to uh, what the ground truth location is. And as I mentioned, this is extremely important in the dark. So what we did is we took this robot and we covered 
a camera if, that is typically used for indoor navigation with, uh, 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 we occluded it. So here you're seeing it from the camera's field of view. And we made the environment darker for it. And we wanted to compare how our system would work with millimeter waves to how a vision-based system on the right called VIO, visual inertial odometry would work. As you can see, our system works very well. It is still able to track the robot. This is, these are the blue dots. While on the right, you could see that the VIO system, which is shown in green, is unable to update its location because it's not able to track feature changes in the environment when you have darkness or featureless environments. And in this way, this is how we're showing that these next generation millimeter wave radars and millimeter wave RFID tags can be used to solve new problems in robotic uh, indoor navigation systems. So I've told you about decoding hidden worlds in uh, the ocean, uh, in robotics. Next one, I wanna tell you about how we're doing this in the context of augmented reality headsets. And the basic idea is that we were motivated by our success in enabling robots to see things that are otherwise hidden. And we wanted to bring the same kind of capabilities, but to augmented reality headsets. And if we can do so, then we can give headsets something like X-ray vision, allow us humans to be able to see things that are otherwise not visible to the human eye. I wanna play another video for you, narrated in uh, the voice of my PhD student, Mason. This new invention combines wireless signals with computer vision to find items that are hidden from view and guides the user towards the desired items for retrieval. This new invention dubbed XAR relies on a new flexible conformal antenna. The researchers designed this antenna to fit on the Microsoft HoloLens without blocking any of its cameras and sensors. The system leverages RFID tags that are batteryless, cheap, and already deployed on billions of items such as apparel, consumer products, and inventory items. First, the user can choose the item that they would like to find in the inventory. For example, a specific t-shirt. In order to find hidden items, XAR sends wireless signals that power up the RFID tags in the environment. The tags then respond back with their unique identifier, even when they are inside boxes or behind other objects. XAR creates a virtual 3D map of the environment. As the user walks, XAR tracks the headset's trajectory and combines it with RF measurements to estimate the location of the RFID tag in the environment. XAR opportunistically leverages the natural human motion to collect measurements from various locations and narrow in on the position of the requested item. When XAR is confident of the location of the item, it is visualized on the AR glasses as a holographic globe for the user. XAR uses the hand tracking technology of the HoloLens and combines the RF measurements with the trajectory of the user's hands to verify if the correct item is indeed picked up by the user. This technology has many industrial and retail applications. In warehouses, XAR can boost efficiency by guiding workers in restocking inventory and packing orders and returns. In retail stores, XAR can help store associates to quickly locate items that might be hidden enabling them to find misplaced items, fulfill customer orders, and restock shelves. In smart manufacturing, XAR can provide guidance to users by visualizing assembly tasks, labeling tools, and locating specific parts to enhance productivity and reduce errors. Augmented reality with RF perception can change the way we work and interact with our environment, making it so you can see what we did here is we took this capability that we had in the robotic systems and we put them on augmented reality headsets. Now to do this, there were many challenges that we had to address. For example, we had to design this antenna that can fit on the headset in a way that it does not block the visors, but at the same time, it has enough bandwidth in order for it to be able to do the dual frequency ultra wideband excitation. One of the interesting problems that we faced was how do you enable localization on the headset while exploiting natural human movements? So uh, one of the set standard techniques for localization is called synthetic aperture radar. And the idea is that if you have an RFID tag and you have an antenna, then you can localize it similar to how I was saying before, 
you transmit a signal, you get its response, and then you're able to localize it on some sphere. And as the antenna moves, you're able to collect different measurements and combine them together. And in fact, you can combine them in a, uh, uh, in a way that maintains their phases, so what's called coherent combination, using this standard synthetic aperture radar equation that I don't want to go into details for. And this has been used in the, fa in the past in uh, some of our previous systems, including the robot that I just told you about, and in state-of-the-art, even uh, robotic truck systems. However, with robots, robots, they can move on specific directions and a constant speed. But humans, natural human movements are neither done in a specific direction nor at a specifically constant speed. So if you try to apply the exact same thing with natural human movements and try to approximate them as if they are in a specific direction and speed, just applying that approximation will throw you off completely. And you will not be able to use localization in order for you to the same kind of localization equations to narrow in on, um, on the RFID's location. And this is because small changes in the antenna locations cause large phase changes in the complex RF reflection. And that prevents you from being able to localize correctly. And so we wanted mechanisms that would allow us to locate tags while exploiting natural human motion. Now, remember that the big problem was that we it's difficult to approximate it as a specific uh, on a specific line and direction. And so to overcome this problem, what we did is we exploited the AR headsets built-in sensors in order to track human movements. So remember that the AR headset itself has some sensors that allow us to capture its location. And what we did is we learned the transformation between the AR headset sensors and the antenna itself. And by learning the transformation between the HoloLens and the position, we can now take these and apply them into the SAR equation. And using that, we're able to now apply the standard SAR equations and get extremely high location accuracy within less than 10 centimeters. And that allows us to deliver the capabilities that I was talking about before in allowing people to find and locate items and be able to retreat. Motivated by our success here, recently we founded uh, a startup to commercialize our, our research on AI-based RF visual sensor fusion. And we're already leveraging the fact that already the that RFIDs are already deployed and we want to use them for high resolution mapping and localization in indoor environments starting in retail and supply chain. So I wanna show you one example of how our technology is already being used today. What we do is we go in, we create, you, uh, we're able to create maps that have the location of every individual item. And you can use this today in fashion stores to locate items. For example, over here, you have someone who is searching, you have a shopper that walks into a store, they wanna search for an item in the store, they can use their mobile phone. And because of our system, they're able to locate the item. So for example, he's searching for a boutique in a store. And now we're able to tell him exactly what zone of the store this boutique is in. Why? Because it is tagged with an RFID and our systems are able to locate and map every individual item that is in the store. So here you could see that he goes in and he's able to find it in the zone that we localized it in. But remember that our accuracy is even higher. And so it can be used to also optimize operations in the store. So here you have a store associate that there's a, an item that is near the dressing room and they need to know where this item needs to be taken on the sales floor. So what they can do is again, they can use their mobile phone, scan the item, and then we can tell them exactly what zone and what furniture the item was in on the floor. So they can go ahead, they take the item, they know what furniture it needs to be at. And then they can go ahead and put it on that furniture without having to go and search all the store to find where it is. And so there's many applications for this ability to locate items in retail, uh, to do indoor asset tracking and operations, and also in warehouses, manufacturing, uh, and so on. And this is how our ability to locate items 
using aug a combination of augmented reality and RF, we're able to deliver new operational efficiency in these environments. In the last part of my talk, I want to briefly talk about a different form of smart environments that we have been working on. And the question that motivates those is, can we map and localize in the environment without requiring any tags altogether? We don't want RFIDs. For example, what we want to do is be able to do this by relying entirely on wireless signals like Wi-Fi. And you might be wondering, how can I do that if the item is not tagged or a human is not tagged altogether? The idea is that if you have a Wi-Fi device in the environment, it emits low power wireless signals. And if there's a person, these signals will reflect off the person's body and come back. So wire, wireless signals are invisible signals that travel in space and reflect off other objects. And we can use this in order for us to sense people without any contact and without any sensors on their bodies. And the really nice thing about Wi-Fi or these wireless signals is that they can go through walls, which is why we can see, use them to sense through occlusions or get Wi-Fi from another room. I want to show you a video from uh, one of the systems that I built in this space. In this video, we put our device in another room behind the wall. In the bottom left corner, you can see the output screen of the device. And notice the red dot on the screen because it tells you where the device thinks the person is at every point in time. Now, before I play the video, I just want to say that the spiral on the ground is only there to show you the level of accuracy. As I play the video, you'll see that the device is able to track the person very accurately. And it does so by relying entirely on wireless signals reflected off of his body. Not only can we track a person's location, because we're tracking them from reflections, we can also track their limbs. So for example, we can track someone's limbs and allow them to control appliances by pointing at them. Here, we track my colleague Zach's link, uh, hand and allow him to control appliances just by pointing. And of course, if you leave a room and forget to turn off the light, all you need to do is to point in the direction of the action. And as I mentioned, we're doing all of this using a device that is on the other side of the wall over here in the adjacent room. Now, in this example, the person was moving, and you might be wondering, what happens if the person is, stat is staying still or relatively static, like me sitting now? Are we still able to locate them? And the answer is not only can we locate them, we can even track their breathing using wireless signals. So for example, over here, the person is sitting down, and to the left, you can see that we're able to track his breathing motion. And when the person will hold their breath, like now you stop seeing the signal variant. The reason is that when, when our chest is moving, it impacts the wireless signals in the environment, and we have enough sensitivity to be able to capture the changes in the wireless signals from the chest movements. But when the person help, holds their breath, we're also able to measure that, and when they release their breath, we can measure these changes again. One of my favorite applications was actually in using this as a baby monitor. So if you look at the output of a baby monitor, for example, like here, you see in the top left that time is passing. But when you look at it, all you see is a still image. So we took this and we augmented it with the output of our device. And what we showed is you can able to get the baby's breathing. So this is the inhale and exhale motion. And we can also get the baby's heartbeat. So for example, here, they're 126 beats per minute, which is actually normal for uh, an infant this age. So we built on this uh, technology and uh, because of these capabilities, we were actually um, uh, invited to the White House uh, a few years ago when uh, President Obama was uh, the president, and we demoed the president. Uh, uh, we demoed the device to the president. Now, 
I have many uh, anecdotes from that visit. Uh, so let me share one of them. If you actually go and look at the video, you'll see that my uh, colleague, Zach, at some point, uh, he starts laughing in the middle of the video during the demo. And the reason is that I was the subject of the demo and uh, we were measuring my breathing and heart rate. And uh, Zach could see that the device was measuring that my heart rate was 110. And the president could see that too, because I was demoing and I was clearly stressed. And what is really nice is that what started as a crazy idea of can we see through walls with wireless signals has now become a field uh, of wireless sensing where we've shown that you can get people's locations, gestures, breathing, heart rates, all using wireless signals reflect off, it, off of their body. It also led to the first startup that is based on my research called Emerald that is currently using the technology to monitor thousands of patients with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, COVID-19. And it has also had commercial impact it's part of the next generation of Wi-Fi, it's core to 6G discussions, and it's influenced many products that are already on the market in RF sensing. And with this, I've told you about our research on decoding hidden worlds from the ocean to robotics, augmented reality, and smart environments. And what motivates all of this work is that I wanna be able to use signals and communication to be able to sense connect and perceive the world in ways that were not possible before and use these new capabilities in order for us to solve a wide variety of problems ranging from robotics to healthcare, smart environments and climate. With this, I will wrap up my talk. Uh, thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Madel. And very nice talk, and uh, uh, we all enjoyed it. I hope also the the participants. And I would like to encourage the uh, participants to ask some questions. Uh, please write into uh, the chat box your questions in the QA chat box. So far, there are no questions, but I maybe I can start to ask you questions about the. Uh, Backscatter communication. Uh, so uh, you mentioned about the distance, uh, uh, right? So I think the distance is pretty limited. So you cannot go to very long distances if you want to do backscatter communication. And also the energy that you can harvest from the backscatter communication is not that much to my knowledge, but please, can you elaborate on these uh, two questions? So that was, I'm assuming you're you're talking about it specifically in the context of underwater backscatter or backscatter yes, yes. in general? Yes, yes, underwater, yes. So that was actually one of the biggest questions that we had when we started this technology, when we started yeah. working with this technology. And what we showed last year is that you can actually extend it to kilometer scale distances. Now you might be wondering how can we achieve kilometer scale distances if uh, like using backscatter alone? And kilometer is really good because as I mentioned, yeah. More than half of the ocean is like less than a kilometer deep if you're doing this from the top. And in offshore environments, you can do a lot of coastal monitoring. There's two reasons for this. First, um, if you make it like backscatter, you can make it very efficient in the sense that one of the things that we develop is these uh, retro reflective tags that similar to like uh, the, the RIS, which is, uh, but not for RF, but for underwater environments. And that can give you a significant gain because there's two problems with backscatter. The first problem is that it's um, is that the you're, you lose the energy twice on the downlink and the uplink. But the bigger problem is that you do you reflect in an omnidirectional way. And so if you're able to apply the gain, if you're able to build retroreflective tags, then you're getting the gain twice. You're getting the gain on the downlink and on the uplink. And rather than suffering from one over R to the power four, you make it closer to one over four R squared. And now it brings you closer to the ability of being able to do similar to one-way communication, but you're doing it uh, uh, as backscatter. That's one part. The second question that you had is about uh, like the energy harvesting part. And Backscatter is useful with or without being battery free or energy harvesting. Because what we've done is we've reduced the energy consumption 
in comparison to traditional underwater models by about uh, a million times. So now one option is that you harvest energy, whether you're harvesting energy from sound, whether you're harvesting energy from the ocean itself, for example, from sediment using microbial fuel cells, but also you can put a coin cell battery and that battery can last for decades. So even because you reduce the energy consumption, which is the most important part, now you're able to run for a very long period of time without you running out of battery. Yeah, I asked you about the percentage that you can harvest energy from backscatter, right? Is it, uh, you know, to my knowledge, not that much. So, uh, so what is the percentage that you can somehow harvest energy from backscattering? So that's a, when people talk about energy transfer, there's two ways that they, that they talk about it. When you're talking about near field, you talk about the total percentage of the power that you harvest. But when you talk about far field, you usually talk much more about the energy conversion efficiency. So among the energy that is that you receive, how much you actually, you convert it to energy. In radiative, in RFIDs, for example, in general, it's a fraction of a percent that you're able to get from what you transmit remotely. But you usually don't think about it as at the individual uh, node level, because there is usually a network of nodes. Like if I have a thousand RFIDs, each RFID is getting a fraction of a percent, but in total, you're actually getting a large number of that uh, of that energy once you sum it over all the RFIDs. So the answer to that is that individually, it's a fraction of a percent. But if you integrate over all the tags that are deployed, then it becomes, I mean, much more efficient. It's probably still not a hundred percent, but it depends on the density of R of uh, RF tags or of uh, underwater acoustic tags that you've uh, deployed. Yeah, I agree. But the question is about, of course, the optimum number of these tags that you will put together. And so instead, uh, you mentioned uh, there is this, that was a, uh, above the water, like, uh, uh, you know, kind of like buoy or whatever, a little ship or something and then you had this underwater device and it was sending so and then getting back scattering right uh, why can't you do the other way around that means that particular device can transmit its own i'm sure it has ample power there that it can do a remote powering to these devices right so yeah uh, and it will be a much more efficient way to do it right you could also do but um, you couldn't remotely power it, you mean, from the buoy? From the buoy or that device that you had, right, in one of those slides that, uh, like, uh, you know, drifter or something, I don't know, yes. it was like a, something on the wall, on the surface of the water. And then uh, I'm sure it may have ample power, it, you know, either you have that power source there or solar energy, because they can get the solar energy, these, those Correct. drifters. Yep. And then you can just uh, uh, remotely uh, uh, transfer the energy to these devices, right, in the underwater. You're so absolutely that, right. The question is, you know, uh, uh, of course, pros and cons, right? How much do you gain from the backscattering and how much you can get from these remote powering, right? Remote so uh, energy transfer. The, the answer to that is, in that scenario, I would still use backscatter for communication but I would use the remote powering for powering up because assume I have a device that is kilometer deep. Do I, do I want to transmit, try to get a watt over to it? Or am I happier getting a microwatt over to it? And I'm much happier transmitting, like using, if I use backscatter, then a few microwatts is enough. So if I'm beaming down this energy, I'd rather beam a watt than beam... I'd rather only have a, a microwatt received than have it to be in a whole watt, which is a million times more power, because then it requires a million times longer to power it up and get the same throughput out of it. So along the same uh, lines, there is also a question from Yang Ki Chang. Uh, he says, thanks for your great talk. I'm wondering about practical imitations for underwater ultrasound backscattering. There should be many obstacles for communication, such as fishes, rocks, trashes, etc. 
plus, of course, you know, murky waters and all that. So he didn't put it there, but I can add it. And the salty waters. Do you have any comments about it? It's an easy question, but anyhow, please Yeah, I mean, many of these are so small that they don't, it's, it's a very good question, but they don't impact. Like for example, rock, you're gonna get a reflection from the rock. You get reflections from all of these, but they're not gonna, they have to be super big in order for them to truly block and very close in order for them to actually block your signal. But what ends up happening is that you get multipath reflections from them and you can easily deal with these multipath reflections using any of the like uh, uh, communication protocols that deal with multipath already. It ends up being ISI, inter-symbol interference, and you can have different equalizers that allow you to deal with them. Okay, and uh, so there is another question from Onji Guo says, thank you for the great talk. Uh, you know, also, uh, Tahir Shah just says, very interesting webinar. I'm really happy to join this, but I want to continue with, Tahir doesn't have any question, but Hongji has a question. I'm wondering what is your perspective on the role of RFID in the area era of 6G wireless systems? Will millimeter wave or terahertz RFID emerge and replace existing RFIDs? I don't think they will replace them. And plus it takes such a long time to actually replace these types of technologies. What they will probably do is complement them. Like for example, what RFIDs are two, two cents. So they're so cheap, they've been so standardized. That's why there is like a hundred billion RFIDs already. What millimeter wave and terahertz RFIDs are gonna do is they're gonna enable new capabilities, like even more miniaturized tags. They're gonna enable uh, uh, potentially like more beam steering, even higher accuracy localization. So, and this is how we've been thinking about them. So how do you use these millimeter wave tags, for example, RFID tags for indoor drone navigation? Uh, terahertz have to currently much more limited range, but they can also give you even higher accuracy. So you can think about micro robotic manipulation that is gonna end up happening in that space. So the most likely thing that is going to happen is that these new ones are not going to, at least not in the near future, not in the next five to 10 years, going to replace the old ones. But what they're going to do is enable new capabilities. Uh, and these capabilities are going to be exciting and capable as well. Okay, so uh, I think it's enough now so that we can go to Alessia for your life lessons. And I would like to ask the participants to stay here and uh, listen to Fadel's uh, uh, kind of life suggestions and uh, recommendations for you. I think in my opinion, uh, that's much more interesting and important for other researchers to listen to successful people and uh, uh, you know see how they achieve uh, uh, the success in their careers instead of just listening to their technical talks. So that's why we added this life lesson session. And I hope you will stay here and uh, and listen to us. Thank you again, Fadel, and really Thank appreciate you so it. Alessia, Thank you. it's yours. Thank you so much, uh, Ian, for moderating this session. And thank you so much, Professor Adib, for uh, your Thank remarkable you. presentation. So here we are. We can start our Wisdom Corner Live Life Lessons, which is based upon the idea to give a unique and special angle to this series of webinars, so adding a personal touch. So we'll start with my first question, if it is okay. Um, so I would like to ask you, which is your hard-earned life lessons or even failure that you would like to share with us today that might help somebody attending the webinar? Um, I think the, the biggest thing in general is um, rejections and like setbacks are part of the way to to getting to success in the sense that in academia also some, we often worry so much about papers getting rejected about uh, we take them very personally as if each of them is a grade for us um, I lost count of course of the number of papers that I've gotten rejected that I've had the more junior someone is the harder it is uh, to, to keep pushing through and um, 
there's really no solution around persevering and, and pushing through. When I was working on the very first project on seeing through walls with Wi-Fi, um, I remember, I mean, our paper was on the verge of rejection. Uh, and then uh, because people were like, is this possible? Like, what is this? What is this going to be used for? Is this used? like people when you're working on something new, people question it a lot. And uh, we pushed through and the paper eventually make, made it. And 10 years later, it won a test of time award because of uh, like impacting, creating a, sub, a new subfield in our in our space. Um, and so the main thing is that there's really no uh, like setbacks are part of the journey. And there's also, that's one part of it. And there's no shortcut to hard work. Like all of this comes with a lot of hard work that goes into each of these projects. And I say, of course, a very nice story about each of these projects, but there were so many ups and downs in them. And actually part of what I describe, what I try to describe when it comes to the technical challenges is, look, we face this problem. And this was a really big problem. And we started to think about how we can overcome this problem. Um, so I'd say that's the probably the, the so a couple of the most hard learned lessons. Very clear, thanks. Uh, and which field and in which topics would you recommend students to study today? Is there any current trends or emerging areas of research that you find particularly exciting or promising? Um, it's a difficult question because my answer is usually to. I don't like working on things that many other people are working on. Uh, it's the first thing that is important is it's really important to build strong foundations. And of course, I think building foundations in electrical engineering and computer science and artificial intelligence, these are very strong foundations that, that are needed. As to like specializing in a specific thing beyond that, uh, while it is very important to learn the state of the art tools, it might be even better to work on things that are different and unique. Um, I mean, this is my personal style, but I like working on things that are different. If I wanted to work on a more classical approach, then I probably would not have worked on seeing through walls or how we can enable ultra low power underwater backscatter, uh, underwater communication. But at the end of the day, that's the difference between contributing to a, to a field and potentially starting a completely new one. Uh, but when you're doing that, there's even your, there's new challenges where it becomes, how do you, like you're in a complete, in a very new space and you're questioning to what extent something is going to grow and have impact. And you have to put even more effort to convince the world of the extent of impact that a new technology is going to have. Yeah, definitely. And uh, is um, I would I would like to ask you what what advice would you give to young people interested in pursuing a career in academia or research? Which key skills and qualities you believe are essentials in for success in academia and research? I the number one skill is like hard work and perseverance. Mm -hmm. uh, and I I think the other thing is finding mentors that. Mm -hmm are very, um, that you can trust and that can guide you. Because for example, when I was very uh, unhappy about my, like the status of my, uh, like the first paper that was gonna get rejected, the seeing through walls with Wi-Fi, I had my PhD advisor and she told me, look, this is great work. Uh, it's gonna get somewhere. Uh, we just have to like, you, you, you just have to be patient. And I trusted her because of, I know that she's been uh, well established. And so it's important to work hard, but it's also important to get mentorship that can help someone direct their efforts in the right place so that they can be as successful as they want to be. Absolutely. Encouragement uh, is, is extremely important. Absolutely. Um, what initially sparked your interest in your field of study and how did you pursue it? Um, in terms of it, like, there's different levels of sparking interest. There's going back to high school. I was interested in general in engineering and building things. I like making things when it comes to choosing research problems. I really like working th on things that are, that I and the world think are impossible, uh, because then it becomes, this is what motivates the coding hidden worlds. Um, 
because then it, it's a personal challenge uh, in order to be able to overcome it. And so that is what personally motivates me. For example, seeing through walls was truly motivated that Superman can see through walls and can we build technologies that allow us to do that. Um, the ocean work was motivated by climate change uh, and so on. So these are the types of, of problems that I think are very meaningful because now you know that you're working on a hard technical problem, but it could have a real interesting uh, impact on the world. Great. And uh, could you tell us one of the most tangible contributions that you have made in your career that had a direct impact on your life, professional or even personal, and on others' lives that you're most proud of? Well, I mean, the, the work that I'm most proud of the impact of already is the work that we've done on, again, the seeing through walls with Wi-Fi, because it's used today to save people's lives. It's used for monitoring people at home, the startup that came out of it deploys these sensors at home and it monitors disease progression in Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis. Uh, because you take this device, you put it somewhere and it can monitor the person anywhere they are in their home. So if they are taking a drug, you can now personalize the drug in the sense that if they're improving, you're able to monitor these changes in mobility and you can adapt the drug to it. It's accelerating uh, clinical trials and drug discovery because rather than having to bring in patients and monitor them, now you can monitor patients at home when uh, you're releasing new drugs. So in that sense, of course, I am very proud of the impact that it's had. At the same time, I'm very excited about the impact that our work in the ocean is going to have on climate change. But that work is even newer, so it's going to be a while before we do that. And I'm very excited about our what we're going to be doing in searching for aliens with, uh, with NASA scientists by using our ocean technology. So there's stuff that, of course, I'm proud of because it's been around for a while, but also things that I'm very excited about their potential in the near future. Wonderful. I have a, have a last, very, very last question. How do you think, in your opinion, generative AI will impact the future of research and everyone's life in general? Uh, generative AI is a new technology that has proven to be very powerful. Uh, in general, we always, I mean, if you think about the internet, right, the internet had uh, a lot of impact, then mobile had a lot of impact, and wireless had a lot of impact. Gen AI is going to have a similar kind of impact, and we're going to have to adapt to it. There's going to be new industries, and there's also going to be, uh, like, some workforce is going to be disrupted. We're going to be using it in, um, in different and new ways. Um, Electricity also had a lot of impact. So each of each, every new technology that comes out is going to have impact. And I imagine that's the type of impact that it's going to have. From a research perspective, there's a question of how much more work is there actually in Gen AI? And I don't know the answer to that. But the belief is that a lot of the work has been, uh, is, is getting to a maturity level. And a lot of it now is in the commercial sector, in commercial, in like uh, extracting uh, new capabilities out of it. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank so you. we end now our Wisdom Corner. Ian, if you want to come back on stage uh, for our closing. Yes, uh, again, thanks a lot, Fadil, for everything. And thank uh, you. again, I hear a lot of good feedback from the participants. Thank you. And uh, I wish you a nice day, Fadel. And thank we you. also let the other participants know we have many fantastic speakers and leaders lined up the next several months. Please go to our website and you will see uh, their names and uh, the titles of their talks and uh, biographies. And we look forward to seeing you again. My best regards and greetings from Iceland. And I will go and enjoy uh, the country more now. So thank you again. Have a thank nice you so much. Thank you so yeah. much, uh, Professor thank Fadel. You. Thank Ciao, you. Alessia. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye bye. Ciao, Ian. Thank, thank you so much. Bye. Yeah.